Welcome to part 4 of the Community Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg, where we take a look at various cases from around the world submitted by you. If you would like to submit an entry, check out the link below, and if you're new to the series, also make sure to watch the previous parts, which totals to about 8 hours of content. And without further ado, let's begin. Back in 1986, there was a 10-year-old boy named Juan Pedro Martinez. He had dark hair and brown eyes, was about 5 foot 4 inches tall, and weighed around 140 pounds. His parents were named Andres Martinez and Carmen Gomez. Juan Pedro sometimes went on short trips with his dad. Juan was interested in a place called the Basque region in Spain because of something he learned in school. His father was well aware of this interest, so he told him if he did well in school, they could go there together. Juan took these words seriously and he worked extremely hard. He did eventually obtain good grades and then went on an exciting adventure to Spain with his dad. On June 25th, 1986, Andres had a job to deliver 20,000 liters of sulfuric acid from Cartagena to Bilbao in the Basque region. The whole family, including Carmen and Juan Pedro, got into the truck all set for the long journey. It was going to be more than 8 hours of driving, covering over 500 miles through steep, narrow mountain passes. When they reached the Somo Sierra mountain pass, something didn't seem right. We may never fully understand what happened inside the truck that day, and many details remain unclear. It's said that Andres was driving in what was described as a strange way. This caused one car to veer off the road, knocking the mirror off another. Even though the roads in the Soma Sierra mountain pass are steep and have sharp turns with cliffs, the truck was going at an exceedingly fast speed, reaching around 90 miles per hour. At one point, while attempting to take a curve too quickly, the truck tipped over. The front part of the truck collapsed when it crashed, causing Andres and Carmen to lose their lives instantly. Sulfuric acid started spilling, leading to small explosions. To prevent the acid from reaching nearby water, large amounts of lime were used to absorb it. Initially, investigators thought the truck's brakes had failed, causing the accident. But the brakes were fine, and it seemed as though this was just a terrible motor accident. But this doesn't explain why Andres was driving so recklessly in the unfavorable conditions of the roads. Much of the information regarding the accident has been kept private, but a few details have become public over time. Another peculiarity alongside Andres' reckless driving was the absence of Juan. Despite extensive searches in the area, there were no clues or signs of where Juan went. Missing posters for him were put up everywhere just in case he had somehow wandered away from the crash site. It didn't take long for a number of tips to be called in. People who claimed to have witnessed the accident or arrived at the scene reported seeing a white Nissan Vanette stop near the crash truck afterward. The driver, a tall man with a mustache, was accompanied by a woman. Both individuals were described as very tall and having a Nordic looking appearance. Onlookers said they approached the damaged truck, took a small package, and then left. It's crucial to note that this information is not confirmed and the accounts may have been exaggerated over time as the story spread online. Moreover, the tachometer, which measures a vehicle's engine revolutions per minute, was found intact on the truck. This device revealed that the truck made 12 unexplained stops during its journey. These were brief stops that didn't align with regular traffic patterns, with the shortest stop lasting only one second. Currently, there's no explanation for these stops, but some speculate that Andres might have been trying to avoid or signal another vehicle on the road, possibly the white Nissan seen at the accident. However, these theories are purely speculative and lack any solid basis. After the accident, there were numerous reports of a boy resembling Juan. The first sighting occurred in Bilbao, which was the intended destination of the family. Most of these sightings lacked verification and the details provided often didn't link them conclusively to Juan. However, one frequently mentioned sighting had a remarkable resemblance to him. In May of 1987, a blind woman entered a driving school in Madrid, Spain. The owner claimed she was of Iranian descent and sought directions to the US Embassy. A boy around 10 years old appeared to be guiding the woman and spoke Spanish with a local accent. When the school owner inquired more about the boy, the woman abruptly changed the subject. The owner found the boy to be somewhat disoriented and later identified a photo of Juan Pedro as the boy he saw that day. 
Theories revolving around this case are abundant, one of which suggests that Juan lost his life in the crash with his parents, but his body simply dissolved in the acid leaking from the tanker behind his seat. Now, this particular theory was later debunked, but nevertheless, it is frequently brought up when discussing this case. It's entirely possible for sulfuric acid to dissolve a body, however, it would have taken several days to do so. The crash occurred in front of witnesses, which resulted in the truck being searched immediately. This was not nearly enough time for the acid to work. Other theories suggest that Juan was kidnapped by traffickers and ultimately killed. Supposedly, traces of illegal substances were found in the acid. This paired with the reported sightings of a man and woman carrying some sort of package from the vehicle before fleeing has led to investigators believing that Andres was tied to some sort of illegal substance business. A different theory proposes the idea that Juan sustained head trauma and wandered away from the crash after losing some of his memory. According to investigators, there weren't any signs within the vehicle that signified Juan was injured, but since the accident was such a mess, investigators haven't ruled out the possibility that Juan did sustain a head injury. To this day, the fate and whereabouts of Juan are unknown. As 2023 comes to an end and we prepare for 2024, many people, including myself, are preparing to accomplish new goals for the updated calendar year. Did you know that we spend about a third of our lives sleeping? And in total, we also waste years in the time that we try to fall asleep. If it wasn't clear already, I want to improve my quality of sleep next year. That's why I'm happy to announce today's sponsor, Pillow. Pillow is the best sleep tracker app for iOS devices. You can download it on your iPhone, Apple Watch, or iPad. It assists you in discovering scientifically proven benefits of good sleep and how you can get there. Pillow offers unique features that can detect snoring, sleep talking, or any abnormality you may display while you are asleep. From there, the app will provide helpful insights such as chronotype assessment and optimal bedtime and routines. I for one am someone who lies in bed for probably at least an hour or two just trying to fall asleep. Over the course of just a single month, that is anywhere from 30 to 60 hours that I'm wasting. All that time I could put towards something productive such as working on a video. But luckily with Pillow, I not only save this time, but I optimize my sleep which makes my mental and physical performance each day significantly better as well. Every night before bed for the last few weeks, I've been opening up my Pillow app and choosing one of the soundscapes or stories that they offer. I have especially enjoyed listening to their unique stories as I find them extremely soothing and it allows my mind to unwind and clear itself out. I highly encourage you all to give Pillow a try. For new users, use my code don't look at me 20 to get 20% off Pillow Premium and start your 7 day free trial using the link in the description or pinned comments. One of the best things you could do for yourself in 2024 is improve your sleep, so download Pillow today. Thank you to Pillow for sponsoring the video. It was a stormy night on November 23rd, 1953 when an Air Force jet vanished over Lake Superior. U.S. Air Defense Command detected an unidentified object on radar in restricted airspace near the U.S.-Canadian border. The F-89C Scorpion jet from Truax Air Force Base went to investigate. The jet was piloted by First Lieutenant Felix Moncla with Second Lieutenant Robert Wilson observing the radar. Unfortunately, neither man returned from the mission, leading to what Donald Kehoe, a former Marine Corps naval aviator and UFO researcher, called one of the strangest cases on on record. While in the air, Lieutenant Wilson struggled to track the mysterious object that kept changing its course. With ground control guiding them via radio, the Scorpion jet chased the object, flying at 500 miles per hour for 30 minutes, gradually closing the gap. On the ground, the radar operator directed the jet's descent from 25,000 to 7,000 feet, observing the blips on the radar screen as the chase continued. The jet caught up to the unknown object about 70 miles off Keweenaw Point in Upper Michigan, at an altitude of 8,000 feet, approximately 160 miles northwest of Sioux Locks. At this point, the two radar blips merged into one as Donald Kehoe would later describe as locked together. Then, according to an official accident report, the radar return from the F-89 simply disappeared from the GCI station's radar scope. Suddenly, the initial radar signal showing the unidentified object also changed direction and disappeared. 
the United States Air Force, U.S. Coast Guard, and Canadian Air Force conducted a thorough search and rescue operation. Unfortunately, no wreckage or trace of the pilots was ever discovered. The Air Force initially reported the disappearance to the Associated Press, stating that the vanished jet was quote-unquote followed by radar until it merged with an object 70 miles off Keweenaw Point in Upper Michigan. The news appeared in the Chicago Tribune with the headline, Jet to Aboard Vanishes Over Lake Superior. But later down the line, the Air Force changed its story, retracing the initial statement. According to the new version, the ground control radar operator misread the scope. The F-89 completed the mission by identifying the UFO as a Dakota, a Royal Canadian Air Force C-47 aircraft, which was flying off course. Lieutenant Moncla, possibly affected by vertigo, supposedly crashed into the lake on the way back. Canadian officials disputed this account, stating no flights occurred in the area that night. According to Donald Kehoe, who revisited the Kinross incident in his 1973 book, Aliens from Space, two different Air Force representatives provided contradictory explanations to Lieutenant Moncla's widow. In one version, the pilot crashed into the lake while flying too low, while in the other, the jet exploded at a high altitude. The Project Blue Book file, the Air Force's UFO investigation team, said the jet did its job well and claimed the crash was an accident, likely caused by vertigo. They said strange radar behavior was due to odd atmospheric conditions and not finding the wreckage in the deep water was understandable. But the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena found that any mention of the mission was removed from official records. The Aerospace Technical Intelligence Center said there was no record in Air Force files of a sighting at Kinross AFB on November 23, 1953, and no similar case. With no satisfying official explanation, groups not affiliated with the military called civilian saucer groups made their own theories. Some thought the jet hit a protective beam like a quote-unquote concrete wall. Others guessed that the jet may have been taken aboard the UFO. In 1968, local newspapers reported finding military jet fragments near Lake Superior, but this discovery was never confirmed. In 2006, a person named Adam Jimenez, who said he represented the Great Lakes Dive Company, told UFO bloggers and the UFO community that they found an airplane wreck and a metallic object resembling part of a flying saucer in the area. However, UFO researchers found issues in Jimenez's story and discovered that the Great Lakes Dive Company was not actually real. Eventually, Adam Jimenez disappeared without a trace. You might be familiar with the Dyatlov Pass tragedy where nine experienced hikers died unexpectedly in the Russian Ural Mountains. While that case is well known and doesn't need repeating, there's another semi-less famous but eerily similar incident. In southern Siberia's Buryatia region near Lake Baikal lies the Kamar Daban mountain range. This area also witnessed a number of mysterious hiker deaths. Ludmila Korovina, aged 41, was an expert at surviving in the wild and a hiking teacher who was well respected by her colleagues and students. Despite being tough on her students, they thought that she was a great teacher who boosted their confidence and taught them important hiking skills. In the summer of 1993, Ludmila and six of her students planned to hike in the Kamar Daban mountain range, a popular and widely considered safe spot for summer hikes. Everyone was excited about the trip, given Ludmila's knowledge of the area and close relationship with her students. The first person among the six and the one closest to Ludmila was Alexander Creason, a 23-year-old who was like a son to her since she had known him for most of his life. The other five students were Tamor Bapanov, 15, Victoria Zalasova, 16, Valentina Yudachenko, 17, Tatiana Filipenko, 24, and Denis Fochkin, 19. On August 2nd, 1993, the seven arrived at Murino Village to start their hike over the Alps, excited about the clear weather forecast. Ludmila's daughter Natalia led one of the three trekking groups in the area. They planned to meet on August 5th when their routes crossed. The six students were eager to show their hiking abilities after months of preparation, and their close bond had developed during this time as well. The first two days of the hike went better than expected. The group worked hard and climbed the retranslator summit quickly. However, on August 4th, when they began to descend, the weather forecast proved wrong, and they encountered heavy rain. The hikers' progress slowed down because of the added weight from their wet supplies. 
Despite having nearby trees for cover, Ludmila quickly decided to set up camp in an open area due to the exhaustion of the other hikers. That night, they couldn't start a fire, but everyone remained in good spirits. The next morning, they successfully built a campfire, had breakfast together, and set out for the day. They planned to meet Natalia and hoped to surprise the other group, considering how quickly they had climbed the mountain the day before. Later that day, Natalia and her group reached a planned meeting spot, but Ludmila, Natalia's mother, did not show up. Natalia, not too worried, assumed bad weather might have delayed her mother, so the group continued their hike. Unfortunately, something more serious had happened that caused a delay for the hikers. On August 10th, kayakers on the river at the base of the Kamardaban Mountains noticed something in the trees as they paddled downstream. A lone girl stood there looking at them. Some versions suggest that she was covered in dried blood when the kayakers approached. As they cautiously neared her, the girl began crying, trying to share her story with them. She later identified herself as Valentina Yudachenko. She stated that she had been hiking with six others. Frightened, the kayakers took Valentina to the local police department and filed a report. It took her several days to narrate the story of what happened to the other six, and even then, it was confusing and horrifying. Valentina explained that after having breakfast that morning, the group descended the mountain. However, a short while later, Alexander, who was also referred to as Sacha, who was at the back of the group, began screaming. When everyone turned around to see Sacha, he was frothing at the mouth and bleeding from his eyes and ears. He collapsed, shaking on the ground before becoming completely still. Ludmila rushed over to him, urging the others to continue. Desperate to wake Sacha up, Ludmila was in utter distress. The rest of the group hadn't gone far before hearing her cries. They found her exhibiting the same symptoms as Sacha and hurried to assist. Ludmila was bleeding from her eyes and nose, foaming at the mouth, and shaking violently before falling onto Sacha. Tatiana, the first to reach Ludmila, also fainted, clutching her throat as if struggling to breathe. She cautiously moved to a nearby rock where she repeatedly banged her head until she became limp. Dennis hid behind a rock while Tamura and Victoria ran away. Seeing three friends seemingly die within minutes, Valentina was left frozen. Victoria and Tamura collapsed and died while running, exhibiting the same symptoms as the others. Valentina and Dennis, realizing they were the only survivors, sprinted away. However, Dennis soon collapsed violently as well. In a panic, Valentina left him behind, taking only a tent and the clothes on her back. Valentina hurried down the mountain, ensuring she was far away. She set up tent for the night under sufficient tree cover and fell asleep. When she woke up and realized that she was still alive, Valentina knew she needed resources to survive in the woods alone. The problem was, to get these resources, she had to go back to where her friends had died. Valentina climbed back up the mountain, retracing her steps because she felt she had no other choice. When she reached the spot, she found that none of her friends had moved from where they had fallen. Valentina quickly collected the supplies she needed from their bodies, ensuring they were all deceased, and then headed towards the power lines. For four days, she followed the power lines down the mountain, hoping someone would find her before she came across a river. On the fourth day, the kayakers found and rescued her. Even though the police received a report, no formal search took place until August 24th. It took two days for helicopters to find the remains because Valentina hadn't shared her version of what happened yet. According to an autopsy report, all of them except Ludmila, who had a heart attack, were determined to have died from hypothermia. They were all found with bruised lungs, but the cause of death was identified as a protein shortage due to starvation and extreme hypothermia. Ultimately, the deaths were deemed accidental. This decision seems strange in light of Valentina's testimony and is crucial to many arguments made in this case. People have come up with many ideas to explain what happened in this mysterious incident, which is understandable considering how much investigation has been done. These explanations, like those for any surprising event, go from scientific reasons to ideas about extraterrestrial life and the supernatural. Some think the hikers accidentally stumbled into a Russian military experiment in the mountains and got killed, with the police covering it up. 
But there are issues with this theory. The open visibility of the hiker spot and Valentina's survival. In the summer, many tour groups visit the Kamardaban Mountains, making a secret military experiment during the tourist season unlikely. The area where the hikers died was open and visible, not fitting for a top secret operation. Valentina's survival is also puzzling. And why were only the others killed? Some researchers believe Valentina's symptoms align with the effects of chemical weapons, especially nerve agents, as convulsions and mouth foaming are indicators of a potent nerve toxin. The autopsy findings, including lung bruising, are consistent with death caused by nerve gas, which can also lead to respiratory difficulty. Ludmila's cause of death, cardiac arrest, fits with nerve agents as well. If they were exposed to a nerve toxin, the other hikers might have died from hypothermia as they could have become unconscious or fallen into a coma before succumbing to the cold. Another theory suggests that the rainwater was contaminated. This theory suggests that the hikers might have ingested poisons from rainborne toxins in their water, possibly from Lake Baikal's toxic waste disposal. Even a water-soluble nerve agent could have contaminated it. Valentina's survival might be attributed to consuming less contaminated water. The hikers could have succumbed to the toxin, causing hypothermia before its full effect. The toxin might not show up in regular toxicology tests. However, a flaw in this theory is that each death seems isolated. It's improbable that only one group would be affected by severely contaminated water if the site was popular among many travelers. Unfortunately, this case is still shrouded in immense mystery, and it's tough to believe that we will ever receive a concise explanation in the future. Every year on May 1st, there are these strange cryptic ads in the Daily Wildcat newspaper. People aren't sure where these ads come from or why they're there. These strange ads in the University of Arizona student newspaper have garnered so much attention that it's earned the name The Mayday Mystery. These ads have been showing up every May 1st since at least 1981. They include confusing things like maps, math problems, pictures, and words, along with a drawing of a smirking man. Included with these ads is the mention of a mysterious group known as The Orphanage. Who or what they are is anybody's guess. There is an entire website dedicated to documenting the mystery if you would like to take a look at the ads for yourself. Simply search Made a Mystery into Google and it should pop up. In the mid-1990s, a student named Brian Hance encountered this mystery and got curious and wanted to solve it. Since then, people like Kate Vesely have tried to figure out the messages, but the true reason for the ads is still unknown. Many online platforms discussed the mystery, and it eventually led to a man named Robert Hungerford, who is often linked to the orphanage group. By 1997, Brian Hance, a junior at this point and the paper's webmaster, dug deeper into the mystery. He found ads dating back to 1981. With the rise of the internet, the Mayday mystery continued to intrigue many more people. Enthusiasts worldwide tried solving it through podcasts, videos, and social media. Now back to Kate Vesely. Unlike her friends who ignored the ads in the paper, she checked MaydayMystery.org and came back to campus every May 1st for the paper. Even after finishing school in 2002, her love for history made her dig deeper into the mysterious ads. Kate spent a lot of time on the site looking at the ads and finding similarities. The same pictures and words, usually showing a smiling man, sometimes with four straight lines for hair, sometimes five. When she wasn't busy with schoolwork, she read the texts, searched the internet for clues, or sat in front of a machine at the library. In 2009, about 15 years after Hans first saw a Mayday ad in the Wildcat, Kate emailed him suggesting that they start a Facebook group. She thought that people could work together to solve the mystery. With Hans's approval, she created Mayday Mystery Fans and began sharing theories and questions with a growing community. Later, she joined Reddit for more discussions on unsolved mysteries, hoping for fresh perspectives. Despite gaining new insights into different aspects of the ads, she still felt far from solving the mystery she spent over a decade pondering. However, over the years, she began forming her own theory. In the 1970s, she believes a group of smart individuals at the University of Arizona created an intellectual fraternity. 
they may have used the newspaper to discuss important subjects amongst themselves. The ads might have begun as a game and evolved into a tradition over the years. Kate has this image in her mind of curious, brainy students eager to discuss science, math, and philosophy. In his last year of college, Brian Hance, feeling stuck in solving the Mayday mystery, sought help on the internet. He reached out through his website asking for assistance in deciphering the puzzle. Surprisingly, he got an email signed by The Orphanage, the same name that caught his attention as a freshman on those ads. The email cryptically said, The day you can see the door, you will be welcomed inside. This mysterious message further intrigued Brian. Instead of leaving Tucson after graduation, he continued working for the university and started a side business. Every May when the ads reappeared, he persisted in researching and sharing clues on his website. His interactions with this group known as the Orphanage included receiving rare coins, news clippings, and letters from different locations. People claiming to be from the Orphanage sometimes called him, informing him about upcoming ads. Other times, he communicated with individuals like himself attempting to solve the mystery. In the early 2000s, he met a person who insisted on an in-person meeting to share her research. He biked to a cafe in downtown Tucson only to find that the researcher was a young girl accompanied by her father from Phoenix. The girl presented her theory that the person behind the Mayday mystery was the Zodiac Killer. She compared images of envelopes from the Zodiac Killer to those that Hans received from the orphanage. Despite the girl's conviction, Hans was understandably skeptical. Ultimately, the girl left, mentioning that she had sent her findings to the FBI. If you recall towards the beginning of the entry, I mentioned the name of a man named Robert Hungerford. Well, down the line, he was confirmed to be the lawyer for this orphanage group, but there was still little information on who this client was. Robert used to be a student at the University of Arizona in the late 1960s. He studied philosophy and later got his law degree there. He was said to speak eight different languages, including Latin, Hebrew, Russian, and Greek. Kate realized that Robert had an office in downtown Tucson and was in his 60s. This wasn't far from where Kate worked for the Pima County criminal justice system. Kate decided to pay him a visit, but when she found his office, there was a business card on the door saying that he was retired. Before leaving, she left a note. It said, I'm a longtime follower of MDM, which stands for Made a Mystery. I was in the neighborhood and wanted to say hello. If you ever keep office hours and wouldn't mind a visit, please let me know." She added her email address and then left. Surprisingly, the very next day, she found a message in her email inbox. Robert communicated that his motivation is for a quote-unquote total social theological transformation, starting on August 30th, 1969. When asked about what will happen, he mentioned a dramatic transformation beyond any sea change. Robert said that one would have to experience it firsthand to understand. His occasional role as the lawyer and go-to person for the orphanage is no secret. Brett Farah, who was once a student and later became the director of Arizona Student Media at the university, recalls talking with Robert. Every year, Robert would politely call to discuss advertising in the May 1st issue. He was polite and professional, using just enough words without being rude, maybe reflecting a different time. At some point down the line, Robert actually got into contact with Brian Hance in order to get him to fix his computer. Hans obviously accepted and he tried to talk to Robert about the Mayday mystery, but Robert remained reserved and focused on business. Despite Hans's efforts, Robert didn't reveal much about the mystery. For almost 40 years, if you drove along Route 16 near Fayetteville, West Virginia, there was a billboard featuring pictures of five children. These kids, Maurice 14, Martha 12, Louise 9, Jenny 8, and Betty 5 had dark hair and serious expressions. Below their images were their names and ages along with speculations about their mysterious disappearances. Fayetteville, a small town with a short main street, was filled with rumors overshadowing any concrete evidence. The community couldn't even agree on whether the children were alive or dead. But here's what we do know for sure. On Christmas Eve in 
in 1945, George and Jenny Sauter, along with nine of their ten children, one of whom was away in the army, went to bed. Around 1 a.m., a fire erupted. George, Jenny, and four of the kids managed to escape, but the other five were never found again. George had desperately tried to rescue them, breaking a window to re-enter the burning house and injuring himself in the process. Amidst the smoke and flames that had consumed the downstairs rooms, he couldn't see anything. The fire had spread through the living room, dining room, kitchen, office, and the bedroom shared by George and Jenny. George was rapidly trying to analyze the situation inside of his head. Sylvia, the two-year-old in her crib, was safe outside. 17-year-old Marion and two sons, 23-year-old John and 16-year-old George Jr. had escaped from their upstairs bedroom. But Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty were likely still in the bedrooms upstairs, separated by a staircase now engulfed in fire. He rushed back outside, hoping to reach his trapped children through the upstairs windows. Strangely, the ladder he always kept against the house was gone. Thinking on his feet, he decided to use one of his coal trucks to access the upper windows. However, despite working perfectly the day before, neither truck would start. In a panic, he searched for another solution. Attempting to scoop water from a rain barrel, he discovered it was frozen solid. Meanwhile, five of his children were still inside the house, surrounded by thick, swirling smoke. Unaware that his arm was covered in blood and his voice strained from shouting their names, he pressed on. His daughter Marion sprinted to a neighbor's house to call the Fayetteville Fire Department, but received no response from the operator. A neighbor who witnessed the fire tried calling from a nearby tavern, yet encountered the same lack of response. Frustrated, the neighbor drove into town and found Fire Chief F.J. Morris. Morris initiated Fayetteville's makeshift fire alarm system, a phone tree where one firefighter called another who then called another. Despite the fire department being only two and a half miles away, they didn't arrive until 8 a.m. At that point, the Sauter's home had already been reduced to a smoldering pile of ash. George and Jenny thought that their five kids might have died in the fire, but when they looked around the area on Christmas Day, they couldn't find any signs of their bodies. Chief Morris guessed that the fire was so hot that it completely burned the kids' bodies. A state police inspector checked the rubble and said the fire happened because of bad wiring. To remember their children, George covered the basement with five feet of dirt. Just before the new year, the coroner's office gave them five death certificates, saying the kids died from fire or suffocation. Even though everyone said the kids were gone, the solder started thinking that maybe, just maybe, their children were still alive. George Sauter came to the U.S. in 1908 at the age of 13. His older brother left him, so George worked on Pennsylvania railroads delivering stuff. He moved to Smithers, West Virginia, starting as a driver and later owning a trucking company hauling dirt, freight, and coal. In Smithers, he met Jenny Cipriani at a store called The Music Box. They got married, had 10 kids, and settled in Fayetteville, West Virginia, known for its small Italian community. Despite being opinionated, George rarely talked about his past in Italy. After their house burned down, the Sodders planted flowers where it stood and reflected on odd events preceding the fire. A stranger inquired about hauling work months earlier, pointing to fuse boxes predicting a fire. Another man, upset by a declined life insurance offer, warned of the house burning, linking it to George's criticism of Mussolini. Despite George's dislike for the dictator, he didn't take the threat seriously at that time. The older sons also recalled a man parked on US Highway 21, closely watching the younger kids before Christmas. On Christmas morning around 12.30, the peaceful atmosphere was broken by a loud phone ring after the kids unwrapped some presents and everyone went to bed. Jenny quickly answered, hearing a lady asking for someone she didn't know. Politely telling the caller they got the wrong number, Jenny hung up. Going back to bed, she saw all downstairs lights on, curtains open, and the front door unlocked. Assuming the kids were asleep, she turned off the lights, closed curtains, locked the door, and went back to her room. Just as she was falling asleep, a sudden loud bang on the roof and a rolling noise startled her. An hour later, she woke up again, this time because her room was filling up with thick smoke. Jenny couldn't grasp how five kids could die in a fire without leaving any bones or flesh behind. To figure it out, she did her own experiment, burning animal bones like chicken, beef, and pork. She wanted to see if the fire could consume them completely. 
every time she ended up with a pile of charred bones. She also knew that investigators found recognizable parts of household items in the burnt basement. When she talked to someone from a crematorium, they explained that even after bodies are burned for two hours at 2000 degrees, bones still remain. However, their house was destroyed in just 45 minutes. The list of strange occurrences kept growing. A telephone repairman informed the Sodders that their lines seemed cut, not burned. This puzzled them because if the fire had been caused by faulty wiring, as the official report said, the power should have been out. Yet downstairs rooms were still lit. A witness came forward saying he saw a man at the fire scene taking equipment used for removing car engines. Could this have possibly been why George's trucks wouldn't start? During a family visit to the site, Sylvia found a hard rubber object in the yard. Jenny remembered hearing a hard thud on the roof and a rolling sound. George thought that it might have been a pineapple bomb used in warfare. In 1947, George and Jenny contacted the FBI for help with their case. However, their situation was deemed a local matter and therefore not eligible to be investigated by the FBI. However, it is rumored that at some point down the line, the FBI did offer help with local authorities' approval, but the Fayetteville Police and Fire Department said no. The Sodders were determined to get to the bottom of the situation, so they hired a private investigator named C.C. Tinsley. C.C. found a link between the insurance salesman who threatened George and the jury that said the fire was an accident. There's also a strange story from a Fayetteville minister about Fire Chief F.J. Morris. Despite Morris officially saying no remains were found, he supposedly mentioned finding a heart in the ashes. This discovery was rumored to be tucked away in a dynamite box and buried at the site. Tinsley managed to persuade Morris to reveal the location. Together, they unearthed the box and promptly took it to a local funeral director. After examining the supposed heart, the funeral director determined it was actually beef liver and had not been affected by the fire. Shortly after this discovery, rumors circulated that the fire chief had informed others that the box's contents weren't found in the fire. Allegedly, he buried the beef liver in the debris, hoping it would satisfy the family enough to halt the investigation. In the following years, more tips and leads kept pouring in. George, spurred by a newspaper photo of school children in New York City, believed one of them was his daughter Betty. He traveled to Manhattan in search of the child, but her parents refused to engage with him. In August 1949, the Sodders opted for a renewed search at the fire site and enlisted the help of Washington, D.C. pathologist Oscar B. Hunter. The excavation yielded various items, including damaged coins, a partially burned dictionary, and a number of fragments of vertebrae. Hunter sent the bones to the Smithsonian Institution, which later issued the following report. The human bones consist of four lumbar vertebrae belonging to one individual. Since the transverse recesses are fused, the age of this individual at death should have been 16 or 17 years. The top limit of age should be about 22 since the centra, which normally fuse at 23, are still unfused. On this basis, the bones show greater skeletal maturation than one would expect for a 14-year-old boy, 14 being the oldest missing solder child. It is however possible, although not probable, for a boy 14 and a half years old to show 16 to 7 year old maturation. The report from the Smithsonian Institution on the vertebrae revealed no signs of exposure to fire. It raised eyebrows at the absence of other bones in what was supposedly a meticulous clearing of the house's basement. Considering the house reportedly burned for only about half an hour, the report found it peculiar that only four vertebrae were discovered instead of the expected complete skeleton skeletons of the five children. The conclusion of the report suggested that the bones were probably in the dirt George used to fill the basement, intending to create a memorial for his children. After the Smithsonian report, hearings in Charleston led Governor Patterson and Superintendent Burchett to close the case, deeming the search hopeless. Undeterred, the Sodders set their attention towards that billboard I mentioned at the start. The Sodders were offering a $10,000 reward for any leads or tips that would lead to a concise conclusion to the case. Immediately, tons of leads began flooding in. One of them included a letter from St. Louis suggesting Martha was in a convent. Another tip from Florida mentioned that they saw the children with a relative of Jenny's. 
George investigated each and every lead he received, but returned home without any answers. In 1968, over 20 years post-fire, Jenny discovered an envelope with no return address in the mail, postmarked in Kentucky and addressed only to her. Inside, a photo of a man in his mid-twenties with a cryptic note on the flip side read, Luis Sauter, I love brother Frankie, A90132 or 35. The resemblance to their son Luis, who was nine during the fire, was striking. Despite hiring a private detective to investigate in Kentucky, they received no further information. The Sodders were apprehensive about revealing the letter's details, fearing harm to their son. Instead, they updated the billboard with Luis's image and hung a larger version in their home. George, expressing the urgency of this revelation, said, Time is running out for us, but we only want to know. If they did die in the fire, we want to be convinced. Otherwise, we want to know what happened to them. A year later, in 1968, George passed away, still hopeful for a breakthrough. Jenny continued the investigation until her death in 1989. The billboard eventually came down as well. However, the investigation persisted through generations with theories suggesting local mafia involvement, extortion attempts, or the children being kidnapped by someone they knew. Born on January 30th, 1989 in Marshall, Minnesota, Brandon Swanson was a 19-year-old college student studying wind turbines at Minnesota West Community and Technical College in Canby. After finishing the spring semester on the night of May 13th, 2008, Brandon went to two parties to celebrate. Though he had some drinks, friends noted that he wasn't very drunk. Instead of his usual route along Minnesota State Highway 68 from Canby to Marshall, which he took every day for classes, Brandon, for unknown reasons, chose back roads on that important night. When Brandon reached the 3900 block of Lyon Lincoln Road, he suddenly swerved off the road into a ditch. Around 2am on the morning of May 14th, he called his parents from his cell phone, explaining that he had essentially gotten stuck. He assured them that he and the car were fine and just needed a ride. He told his parents he thought he was near the city of Lind and saw lights in the distance. They went there to find him, agreeing to flash their headlights on and off for signals. However, after several unsuccessful attempts to locate Brandon this way, tensions started to rise. Eventually, Swanson decided on a different approach. He made his way through a field toward the lights and asked his parents to meet him in the parking lot of a popular nightclub in Lind. Unfortunately, he never reached this destination. 47 minutes into the call, Swanson suddenly exclaimed, Oh no. Then there was a silence. The call didn't end there. It just remained silent as Brian and Annette waited anxiously for their son to explain what was wrong. Sadly, he never did. Uncertain about what else to do, they hung up and tried calling him multiple times, receiving no response each call. Brandon Swanson would never be seen or heard from again. Brian and Annette Swanson Swanson reported their son missing at 6.30 a.m. the next morning. However, local police initially didn't take their concerns seriously, stating that it wasn't unusual for a young man his age to stay out all night. Deputies advised them to be patient and wait for him to return on his own. One officer reportedly said to the worried parents, it's his right to be missing. Upon reviewing Brandon's cell phone records, the police found that on the night of his disappearance, he had actually been close to Porter, about 25 miles away from where he had informed his parents. Soon after, his car was discovered in a ditch near Taunton. Sheriff Eric Wallen of Lyon County revealed that Brandon's phone remained active well into the next day, with officers persistently attempting to call it, only to be directed to his voicemail. Eric Wallen said, We were able to use the cell phone tower technology to have an idea of where his last communications or phone calls came from, so that put us on a cell tower up in that area. We then focused the search there and the car was located. At the site, no keys or signs of foul play were found. The vehicle simply looked like it was stuck in the ditch or partially in the ditch. There was nothing odd about it. If a person passed by, they would think it was just parked there or broken down and stuck. When they finally started searching, a lot of people joined in. Even dogs and helicopters were deployed in the search. They swept both the land and the Yellow Medicine River because some thought Brandon might have fallen into it and drowned. Dogs sniffed around and found Brandon's scent on a trail near the river. They followed it to the water and then across to the other side, suggesting that Brandon might have been inside of the river. 
After that, they went north along the riverbank reaching the Yellow Medicine County line, where the trail suddenly stopped. Dogs also smelled something like human remains a few times near Mud Creek, north of Porter, but they didn't find anything important to Brandon's case there. Nearby, the dogs also detected Brandon's scent on some farm equipment. However, the farmer who owned the equipment did not allow investigators to search his property. In fact, there were several pieces of land in the area that investigators thought would have been good places to search. However, due to legal problems revolving around getting permission from landowners, they couldn't. For instance, local cattle farmers didn't want police search dogs on their property. Even after 14 years, investigators were still dealing with this problem. One officer was quoted saying, In at least a couple of circumstances, that problem is still in existence. They will not allow us on their property. We don't dispute the reason why. We try and work out a method that would make it acceptable, and we've not been able to come up with a working compromise. Another complication in the search is that Minnesota specifically has a very limited amount of dogs that are specialized in scent work available. One officer was quoted saying, The problem is that as time goes on, it becomes much more complicated to fulfill the search because you need to have canines that have experience in aged scent. Now, due to an injury in his younger years, Brandon Swanson faced a legal blindness condition in his left eye, causing challenges in judging distances. Due to this, he typically wore glasses, but for reasons unknown on the night he vanished, he left them in his vehicle. The region had numerous unidentified underground water containers, and authorities explored the possibility that Brandon might have tumbled into one. Moreover, the temperature that night was slightly below 40 degrees, raising the potential that Brandon might have succumbed to coldness, particularly if he fell into the river. Even with some alcohol consumption that evening, his parents insisted that their son sounded coherent, yet uneasy during their phone conversation. In 2023, Sheriff Wallen shared some info regarding new leads still coming in. However, they seemed to all result in dead ends. He said, It seems that every tip that we receive, we investigate and we run into a dead end. It was either false or the information wasn't accurate. They all seem to run into a dead end. Aside from Brandon's car, no other physical piece of evidence related to Brandon has been found. Not his keys, not his phone, not even his clothing. Tim Molnar, a 19-year-old studying aeronautical mechanics in Daytona Beach, Florida, disappeared after leaving for class on January 24, 1984. His last known contact was with his younger brother when he dropped him off at school. Some think he might be a victim of a crime, but his family believes he left to start a new life. The night Tim went missing, his family received a strange call with only static on the line, making them believe he tried calling but got nervous and hung up. Two weeks later, they found out he used his parents' credit card to buy gas in Lake City, Florida. The gas station attendant confirmed he was alone. Four months later, a letter from an auto impound company in Atlanta, Georgia revealed he left his car in a parking lot just a block away from the Greyhound bus terminal six days after he disappeared. Tim's family discovered his driver's license, wallet, credit card, and other belongings in his car, hinting that he might have changed his identity. Several valuable items, including a stereo, an expensive tool set, and a bicycle were missing from the car. It's unclear whether he intentionally disappeared or if something else happened to him. Oddly, he left with only the clothes on his back, but just before leaving, he withdrew almost all the money from his savings account, leaving $10 behind perhaps as a sign he might return one day. Now, more than 10 years later, Tim's family believes he is still alive and wants him to return home. If he does, he stands to inherit $50,000 as a relative passed away shortly after he vanished. The case gained a resurgence in attention in January 1996 when a man named Stephen Cole called a telecenter with some shocking information. He was watching TV and there was a segment covering Tim's disappearance and he recognized his clothing. They were found on a frozen body in Wisconsin a decade earlier. 
The medical examiner, after being contacted, reached out to Tim's family for DNA samples. In November, through DNA testing, the body was confirmed to be Tim's. Keys were also found on him, which matched locks in the Molnar home. Despite the identification, the cause of Tim's death couldn't be determined. There were no signs of trauma, and it remained unclear how or why he traveled to Wisconsin. His family organized a memorial service and laid him to rest in Daytona Beach, Florida. The details of his death continue to be a mystery. Unfortunately, Tim's parents have since passed away, with his mother Helen in 2004 and his father Michael in 2012. Overton Bridge is an old Category B listed structure near Dubberton in Scotland, specifically on Cape Overton. The Category B designation simply means that it is of significant historical or architectural interest. It was built in 1895 from a design by landscape architect H. E. Milner. From the 1950s onward, Overton Bridge in Scotland has been linked to an unusual phenomenon. Dogs, for some reason, either fall or leap off the bridge, earning it the eerie name Dog Bridge. Tragically, many dogs suffer severe injuries or lose their lives as they plummet approximately 15 meters onto the rocks below. Various explanations ranging from accidents to supernatural elements have been put forward to make sense of these strange incidents. The narrative behind the bridge gained more attention in the late 2000s and early 2010s. Since the initial incidents, the bridge has been associated with 50 reported dog fatalities from falls, while surprisingly over 600 dogs have managed to survive the plunge. In 2004, Kenneth Meikle witnessed a strange incident as his family and their golden retriever walked on the bridge. The dog unexpectedly leaped off, surviving but left traumatized. Over the following six months in 2005, at least five more dogs exhibited similar behavior. Alice Trevorrow, a pet owner walking her obedient dog Cassie in 2004, shared her experience. Something eerie is happening on that bridge. Cassie, usually well behaved, jumped in fright, indicating she sensed something unusual. Some people offer a more logical explanation, suggesting that the dogs might react to the scent of small animals below, prompting them to take the plunge. Some people believe that the bridge holds a paranormal connection aligning with what ancient Celts called the Fine Point, which was a mystical place where heaven and earth met. However, a Royal Society for the Protection of Birds investigation revealed nests of mice, squirrels, and minks on one end of the bridge. In a scent experiment with dogs, exposure to mice, squirrels, and mink scents resulted in seven dogs being drawn, particularly to the mink scent. While the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals conducted a survey, their findings did not provide conclusive answers to the mysteries surrounding the bridge. Bob and Melissa Hill have been living near the bridge for years and they have observed multiple instances of dogs displaying agitation and leaping off the bridge. Bob attributed this behavior to the presence of mink and pine martens, causing distress in the dogs. He also alluded to a mysterious atmosphere around Evans Land. On the other hand, a local teacher named Paula Owens proposed a different viewpoint, suggesting supernatural forces were at play. Owens theorized that dark spirits were enticing dogs to their demise. In an even more disturbing incident from October 1994, Kevin Moy, struggling with paranoid schizophrenia, tragically threw his two-week-old son, Owen, over the bridge. His delusional belief that the infant was a manifestation of Satan, influenced by a birthmark, led to this horrific deed. Moy selected the location due to its association with dark spirits dating back to druidic times. Following this heinous crime, he attempted by jumping off the bridge and inflicting wrist injuries. Subsequently, he was apprehended and confined to a mental health facility. On February 5, 1958, a B-47 bomber involved in a collision with another Air Force jet accidentally released a 7,000-pound nuclear bomb into the waters off Tybee Island, Georgia. Remarkably, even after 50 years, the bomb, containing unspecified amounts of radioactive material, remains undiscovered. While the Air Force asserts that the bomb, undisturbed, doesn't pose a threat to the region, persistent search efforts and local residents express skepticism about the potential risk. The bomb ended up underwater when Air Force Colonel Howard Richardson let it go after a mishap with an F-86 fighter jet. 
Lieutenant Clarence Stewart's aircraft systems didn't detect Richardson's plane on his radar and descended right onto it. This collision tore off the left wing of the F-86 and seriously damaged the fuel tanks of the B-47. Richardson, with a two-person crew, was worried that the bomb might come loose during landing due to the damage to his plane. Therefore, he decided to drop the bomb into the water before safely landing at Hunter Air Force Base near Savannah. Stewart ejected and landed safely in a swamp. The Navy searched for the bomb for over two months but couldn't locate it. Today, they suggest leaving it where it is. According to a 2001 report on the search, if the bomb remains intact, the risk of heavy metal spread is low. The report emphasizes that the undisturbed bomb doesn't pose a threat. However, attempting recovery could create a serious explosion hazard. Even though the government has officially halted its quest for the bomb, local residents including retired Air Force pilot Derek Duke still remember the potentially dangerous weapon resting off their coast. In 2004, Duke identified high radiation levels in shallow waters near Savannah. Government officials looked into it and determined that the radiation readings were typical for the naturally occurring minerals in the region. Since 1950, there have been at least six U.S. nuclear bombs which have gone missing and their whereabouts remain unknown to this day. On October 5, 2018, Terrence Woods Jr., a TV producer working on the set of Discovery's Gold Rush in the backcountry of Idaho, went missing. Terrence was a 26-year-old African man with short black hair, brown eyes, and weighed about 130 pounds. He was never seen again after that day. Part of a 12-person group, Terence joined host Turin on an expedition delving into abandoned mines across the mountainous regions of the western United States. Shortly before his reported disappearance, Terence shared a photo on his personal Instagram page. The image depicted a dense forest of trees with a river coursing through, beneath an overcast sky. His caption comprised a solitary word, Idaho. Terence vanished after venturing into a forest in the Oregon area, not too distant from where the aforementioned photo was captured. One evening while finishing the filming, Terence mentioned to a pair of women helping with the transportation that he needed to use the restroom. Soon after, he accidentally dropped his radio. Following this, Terence dashed down a steep cliff into the forest, disappearing among the trees. Attempts by locals, including producer Simon Gee, to follow him down the cliff were hindered by the terrain. When they returned, their clothes were torn and they had blood on them. Gee later told Terence's father that his son ran faster than he had ever seen anyone run before. Terence vanished and the Idaho County Sheriff's Office was notified at 6.41 p.m. on the same day. A Facebook update mentioned that the search didn't start until the next day due to the late report. Search teams including dogs, ground searchers, all-terrain vehicles, and helicopter teams equipped with body heat detection were deployed. Despite extensive efforts, Terence couldn't be found and the search was called off after six days. Later on, Terence's family and friends found the official account of events strange. The original Sheriff's Office report stated that Terence wasn't doing too well emotionally and thus had a mental break. The person who called the police also claimed that Terence was displaying mental health issues during the shoot. But when Terence's family pressed the police for more information, they withdrew the statements about his mental health. The family was convinced that someone was hiding the truth. Terence's family claimed that his employer was responsible or, at the very least, knew more than they were letting on, but they consistently denied withholding any additional information. On Friday, December 15th, 2017, a gardener and housekeeper showed up at the North York house of 75-year-old billionaire Barry Sherman and his 70-year-old wife Honey at 8.30am as they did every week. They used a new lockbox that had been put in place for the realtor trying to sell the $7 million mansion so they could get inside by themselves. The lower level has an underground garage for six cars, a fun area, and an indoor swimming pool. The rest of the house includes five bedrooms, nine bathrooms, a gym, sauna, and tennis court. The housekeeper and gardener didn't see Barry or Honey Sherman, but it didn't bother them much because they weren't expecting them to be there. At 10.30am, a couple who wanted to buy the mansion showed up with their real estate agent for a tour. The house was up for sale by Judy Gottlieb, who was away in Florida. Inside, the three met with another assistant agent who represented Judy. The group toured different parts of the big house and after about 30 minutes, they reached the lower floor. 
The assistant agent wanted to impress the couple with the indoor swimming pool, so she opened the door. Instead of a pleasant surprise, she made a shocking discovery. Barry and Honey Sherman's bodies were hanging from the pool's railings. The agent quickly closed the door and guided the group out, saying that that part of the house was off limits. The agent went to find the housekeeper and called Judy. The housekeeper called 911 at 11.43 and the Toronto police and paramedics were on their way within a minute. The buyer's agent thought it was a scary joke or Halloween decorations. The superstitious couple touring the house were very upset, fearing it was a bad sign. Even though the assistant agent tried to keep them from seeing the bodies, the buyer's agent said the whole group saw through the large glass doors. The deaths obviously raised extreme suspicions. During the autopsies, it was realized that both deaths resulted from ligature neck compression. This type of strangulation is usually different from hanging because it involves a force other than the person's body weight. It was also determined that Barry and Honey had been dead for at least a day. Rigor mortis had passed and their limbs were now relaxed and limp. There were injuries to their wrists and a biopsy was taken to determine if these were recent or old injuries. On that night, the Toronto police made two statements clarifying that they were not looking for any suspects and there was no sign of forced entry into the home. By December 16th, police sources informed the Toronto Star that they were exploring the possibility of a murder-suicide, suspecting that Barry killed Honey before taking his own life. Friends and family of the couple strongly disagreed with this idea, saying it was impossible. They pointed out that the house had nine entrances and both Barry and Honey would have welcomed anyone who needed help regardless of the time of day or if they were a stranger. Their children released a statement urging the police to carry out a thorough criminal investigation and criticized them for making the murder-suicide theory public. The Sherman family was confident that Barry and Honey were murdered. Barry Sherman was the founder and CEO of Apotex Inc., which was Canada's biggest distributor of generic drugs. Throughout his life, he accumulated an estimated net worth of $4.6 billion, making him one of the wealthiest individuals in Canada. Established in 1974, his company was always in a fight against competing companies, government regulators, and anyone who doubted Barry's motives. He sort of saw himself as an underdog fighting against Against patents, courageously taking on giants like Merck, Pfizer, and Bayer to make affordable generic medication available to patients. He once said, if we're thieves, we're Robin Hoods. Winning legal battles was crucial to his success, and he often told employees that they worked for a legal company that happened to sell medication. It's easy to understand how Barry would have made enemies in his field. He also often unknowingly invested portions of his wealth in fraudulent companies. Another potential factor in Barry's death that many people suspect is his ongoing dispute with his cousins led by Carrie Winter and his three siblings. This conflict traces back to the 1960s when the Winter cousins, who lost their parents early on, were under the care of their father, Louise Winter, a pioneer in the generic pharmaceutical business. Barry, in his youth, worked for and learned from his uncle Lou at his company, Empire Laboratory. After his uncle's death, Barry eventually bought and sold Empire Laboratories. The dispute which was initiated by Carrie Winter began in the 1990s. The cousins argued in court that Barry had a financial obligation to them equivalent to one-fifth of his estimated $5 billion of wealth. They claimed that a part of the purchase agreement Barry made stated that they were entitled to a share of the money. However, Barry's legal team countered that the option had never taken effect. According to the terms, the cousins needed to be 21 and have worked for Empire at the time, but neither condition was met. The Winter cousins faced multiple defeats in their case, with one occurring shortly before the deaths of Barry and Honey, leading to widespread suspicion. So it should be emphasized that that's all this is, suspicion. There is no clear evidence to suggest that they were actually involved. The long-standing dispute concluded in March 2020 when Kerry Winter lost his attempt to bring their final appeal before Canada's highest court. Kerry expressed his disappointment with the outcome. Needless to say, this brief overview only scratches the surface of these complex issues. On December 16th, 2019, two years after their deaths, the Toronto Police and the Sherman family jointly announced the closure of the private investigation overseen by the family's attorney. During a press briefing, the Toronto Police Homicide Unit spoke to the media. It appeared that there was a disagreement between law enforcement and the family. 
Up until that moment, 38 judicial authorizations were secured, leading to searches of both residential and commercial properties, examination of electronic devices, and the retrieval of 73 individual records. The Center of Forensic Sciences received 150 items for testing, 243 witnesses were interviewed, 4 terabytes of security video footage was obtained, 205 tips were provided directly to the police by the public, and an additional 343 tips were submitted to the police through the private investigative team. The general consensus is that the police mishandled the investigation by initially focusing on the murder angle. This belief stems from the fact that in the early stages, the police appeared to consider it a murder concentrating their efforts on that particular scenario. Kevin Donovan from The Star has been actively advocating for the unsealing of records related to the case. According to documents that he obtained, the police regarded Honey as a murder victim for the first six weeks of the investigation, suggesting they initially suspected that Barry killed Honey before taking his own life. Donovan criticized this approach. He said, Police decided it was a murder-suicide and then they go down this tunnel. That's bad for an investigation and bad for investigators. You have to look at all suspects and all possible suspects in the first 48 hours. After all the effort put forth in this investigation, there is little to show for it. The circumstances circling the murders of Barry and Honey remains unsolved. That's going to end today's video. If you made it all the way to the end, thank you so much for spending the last hour with me. And for these videos, I've been meaning to show off the actual iceberg image and make edits to it along with you all, but I've been waiting to get this link to make the iceberg public, but I don't know, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem like I'm going to get that. So by the next installment of the series, if I still don't have that figured out, I'm just going to show the images of the iceberg alone without the link to the site. Because the actual creation of these icebergs was kind of the whole point of this series in the first place. So before we end the video, I also want to give a special thank you to all of my patrons and channel members as always for supporting the channel. It means a ton. Thank you so much to Christian Jorgensen, Greg, 4L60E, Adventure Ted, Calescent Carnage, Chaz It Up, Cody Grandman, Courtney Von Schrilts, Emma, Flannery Rose, John Thomas, Chaotic Bluebird, Kimberly Nicole, Mars, Maui, Owl Youp, Saucy Sofa, Schmapton Schmerk, Steve Shirovsky, Aaron the Artistic, Bad Baphomet, Beck Walls, Ben Franchi, Bennett Melillo, Bestial Darkness, Cam Haha, Cheryl Aya Hughes, Chris, Commit Felony Feline, Coy Jones, Coyote Lord, Daniel Lemke, Derek Waterbury, David Veltman, Dim Resin, Dip Shizzle, Ed Will, Eileen McRudry, Evil Dead Bread, Frostcore Club, Fully, Gary, Giselle Sweet Moncour, Grace, Halo Fan 234, Harley, Harley Deadman, Hide Wari, Jackson W, Jacob Adams, Jacoby Gilbert, J Wrecker 22, J Huds, Joseph Mulligan, Joseph Virgin, Josh Falls, Kent, Kiana, King Mog, Lady Fang, Len, Liss Electro, Mad Dog, Main Adam, Marco Espinoza, Martin Serdic, Mick Lover, Me4, Michael Myers, Mijin, Morgan Smith, Nathan Brown, Nathan Flagg, Nick Huber, Knight Burton, Nina Brown, Official Dingus, Okami Fan 1 Productions, Pedro Elizondo Jr., Ray Booney, Ray, Roanch, Roto, Sally Bunce, Samili Moody, Sarah Cruder, Sarah Richardson, Shane Whitehead, Shy, Skylar Moore, Morris, Sophie Livingstone, Stephanie Price, Stephanie Meter, Subtle Spell, Taylor, Taylor Stone King, The Hidden Eye, Teresa Headlam, Tony Swanevelt, Tyler Gray, Typical Ethan, Victor Chamil, Wilder Than Mild, Zion Edison, Minus Five Stars, Sasha Wise, Jerome Reuter, Bad Baphomet, Synth Runner, Astrid Yessing, Neve, Mam Shiba 101, Alan Amaro, Randvar, Ifada Cthulhu, Emma Chacho, Barely Living Dead Girl, Retro Warrior, Psycho Bear, Und Andrea Katana Nanaluski, I am so sorry if I butchered that name, and Tan Vo. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel. Again, it means a ton. This is likely going to be the last upload before Christmas, so Merry Christmas to you all if you do celebrate, and I should have one more upload before the new year. So that's going to be it for today. Thank you all again so much for making it to the end. Stay safe, and I hope you guys all have an amazing week.